Anyway, let's get started. Um, thank you for coming, Keith. My pleasure. Um, all right, he, now some of these questions you might not like, so I'm sorry. <laughs> she okay. refused to show me these yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I couldn't prepare. <laughs> so, okay, what does it mean to make a poem? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, so there'll be a lot of long pauses in this conversation this morning as I try to figure out answers to serious questions. Um, they'll edit those out. They'll edit those out? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't want to do this without sounding too fatuous, but of course, platitudes are what immediately come to my mind. But. Um, it's an act of perception, I think, first of all. I think one of the reasons, one of the things that continues to interest me as a poet, and I mean too, is, is that it is, um, it forces us to continue to look at the world, to look at things in the world. Um, it forces us to respond to them with, with um, whatever senses are, are, are locked in our heads. Um, so there is that, there's, there's that it is, it is almost a, a kind of personal exercise. Um, that's certainly part of it. That my, I think my life would probably be, my life would probably be less without it. Um, other people use different kinds of things. You know, heaven hears music wherever he is in the world. Other people see images. Um, uh, I, I uh, look for words. So there's that. Um, and then there is the other thing about this particular art, which is also shared with certain others of other arts. Um, that when we do this, when we're in the process of, of making this poem, we are connected with people who have been trying to do this for, for several millennia, people who have been trying to use words to organize experience. Um, and when I stop to think about that, it's kind of cool. Um, and I do stop to think about it. You know, people have been, have been trying to do this for a long time, a long time before the invention of writing. People were, people were, were, were trying to organize uh, words into meaningful, often musical, um, often little sonic moments, memorable moments uh, that would help them understand experience. And so it's a, in, in all languages. So it's a nice, it's a nice kind of connection that way. I like it. Great. I like it. Okay. So the next question is also one of these big questions. Um, sure. <laughs> what is the role of beauty in a poem? You could also say, what's the role of beauty in your poems? About beauty. This is actually one of getting uh, skating around things I was thinking about, saying, okay, what's Sarah going to ask me? Um, because it, it, it's, you know, whatever the role of, of the arts is in general, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to, the arts touch on other kinds of human experience, spiritual experience, um, psychological experience, but they are not those things, the arts are not in and of themselves a spiritual exercise or a psychological exercise. Um, they are an exploration of the aesthetic in us, the exploration of beauty. Um, but what is beauty? Um, and and uh, I don't want to say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder because maybe it's not, uh, then I'd be wrong. Um, but, um, there is there is a recognition in us of, of there is a need there seems to be a need in our species for an aesthetic response to the world, um, and that aesthetic response is a response to beauty. But beauty could be a lot of different kinds of things. Um, I happen to respond probably most profoundly at this point in my life to um, things in the natural world both the manifestations of things and then I mean, it gets me worked up and gets me involved in, in uh, uh, certain kinds of activism. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a good deal of my study, not my exclusive study, but a good deal of my study is to learn things about the natural world. Um, and I find those things beautiful. I can find those things beautiful when I see um, uh, a bald eagle tear apart um, a, a dead carp that's been lying there and rotting for two and a half weeks. 
Um, I can find a beautiful one. I see a Cooper's hawk eat a tufty titmouse in my backyard. Okay. And I watch it devour absolutely everything. <laughs> and then go looking for bones and drops of blood afterward and don't find them. Mm -hmm. I'm, no I'm a kid. That whole thing, not have any blood in this stuff. Um, so, um, and, and I know that there are, there are people, there are poets, lots of poets, who respond to um, things in the world that we, we um, consider ugly, and they don't try to make them beautiful, quote, unquote, beautiful, um, but yet the response is an aesthetic response, um, and I think important as an aesthetic response. So what is the role of beauty? Um, Wait, can, what you okay. just said was really amazing. Oh. Like about the that it's that it's not necessarily a beautiful thing, but the response is an aesthetic response. Right, so and that's you, important. I don't think more, that's a feat. Can you say more um, about that? Because I've never thought of it that way, but I think you're really right. That that's um, so maybe is it that I'm thinking on the feet or on the butt. I'm thinking <laughs> fast. Well is the thing okay. Um, go ahead. Tim O'Brien has this this phrase in the things that carry where he says um, the mind hates it, but the eyes do not. So it's, he's responding to this moment in Vietnam where his friend stepped backwards. He was playing catch with his friend, and his friend stepped backwards onto a landmine and blew up. But in his first response to it was that it looked really beautiful. But then his mind figured out what had happened, and it was horrible. So I'm wondering if that's something about what you're saying a little bit, like that it's there's something that's ugly, but somehow, it's not that it's erasing the ugliness by rendering it in language, but what, is there something that happens? Like you said, aesthetic. I don't know the answer, I'm just saying. No, and I don't know either, but it, it <laughs> seems to me very, very clear. I mean, just given, given the absolutely visceral necessity that so many different kinds of people in different kinds of places have, have felt a need, they have felt for some kind of artistic expression. Um, you know, it, it cuts across class, it cuts across race, it cuts across nationality, it cuts across language. Um, that there is a need to recognize and formalize our response to things in a way that I can only call aesthetic, you know, artful. Um, and that that is tied in with what beauty may be. Um, I, mean, I do like that. I mean, I, I think he got, he got pilled in Stockhausen, was it Stockhausen in 2001? Yeah. yeah um, who said, um, a German composer of you know, weird music, um, who, who said um, that 9-11 that, um, that was, was, um, uh, was, was, was a, a, the height of an artistic uh, moment. Um, and that's kind of what we're saying here. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't justifying it, although he spent the next 10 years trying to explain his response. Um, but, but there's, you know, it, it's, it's, we skate toward that direction, which is, which is dangerous and which is, you know, does not going to play well on CNN. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting. And it's, it's, the Tim O'Brien thing is pretty good. It's not quite what I mean, but, but I think it's close. Um, um, you know, Brian really is meaning there's something, before the horror registers, there's something beautiful in that display of all things. Well, maybe um, it's getting back to what you said first about perception, if there's a perception. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a difficult question. And, and, you know, I mean, my, particularly, I mean, most of the stuff I've written in the last 50, 20 years um, is more conventionally beautiful. I like to write about birds, you know? <laughs> I like to write about trees. I like to write about the Great Lakes. Um, you know, it's it's pretty hard not to say that those are beautiful. Um, you know, I'm also continuing to try to write about my great grandmother's suicide, so there's nothing particularly beautiful about that moment. But but the response is an organizing response, which is aesthetic, which I think deals with the nature of beauty. But, oh, it's tough. I have, you know, yeah. yeah, no, that's great. I, 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 sure. You know, the the nature of beauty has to have the opposite. <clears throat> Exactly. Well, exactly. That we can experience the beauty uh, in, a, in a different way. Right. And, and saying the unsayable is what I believe poetry does for me. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, and I, I, probably the only thing I'd add is that, that with the opposites being there, that maybe whatever our sense of what is beautiful encircles both of us. Yes. And, yeah. Okay, great. Next question. Um, sure. Yeah, 
<laughs> um, how do, in your poems, how do sound and vision um, connect? Like, talk about how you think of the line sonically, or how you know, or it's the poem comes in visual, or how they intersect, or don't. You know? um. I mean, again, this gets into lots of areas that, that, that poets and contemporary poets spill a lot of ink about, or, or a lot of ink has been spilled in the last hundred years. Um, I think that, that probably the formative influence for me when I started actually writing poems, and when I started, when I, when I made the leap over from, from, you know, student to, to writer, was, was the image. I mean, I, I, I got that sense of the image, I got that sense of the image um, as it was captured pr primarily in Asian poets and how those poets were um, transmitted into English or French. Um, and so, so, you know, in, in this some important part of my writing life, I was, I was trying to capture images, although those images were often couched in little stories. I think probably my motivation for poetry, my, the thing that's further back there um, is sound, um, is the mnemonics of sound, um, rhythm and repetition, the easiness of, of, of that sort of thing. Um, and of course then that becomes, and that comes back and that's played a lot. I mean I try to, I try to be a little subtle. I mean there's a lot of contemporary poets who, who talk about the sonics of sound and basically what they're talking about to my mind is overly alliterated. And that just seems too easy. Okay? So, this is not sonics. This is alliteration. We've been talking about this for 2,000 years, and you're just alliterating seven times in a row. That's not very effective. Right. Okay. And a lot of our contemporaries are doing that. And that, and that's, and then they say it's sonics. And I, ah, come on, that's not very subtle. You know, our our, our, our experiments with language have been a lot more complex than that. Um, so, uh, but but you know, yeah, the sounds. I mean, you know, there's hidden rhymes in there. Um, the rhymes are. are um, Irregular. I mean, you, you, you look at Laura's poems. Those of you who were in the world last night, you look at Laura's poems on the page. And it's weird. It's going all over the place. You hear her read them. Did you hear all those rhymes last night? I mean, they were like all over the place. It was like Laura. It's like wow. It's kind of like skinny rhymes, skinny little poems that when you read quietly, they look like these skinny little poems. And then when you hear her read them, when you read them aloud, you realize that there's all these irregular rhymes, and she's playing on all the sounds. I was like, whoa! I do not think of Laura Kashishti as gay rhyme, but there were all these good rhymes. That so, I mean, the, the, that's what poetry does. Po poetry organizes words and it organizes the sounds of words. Um, so that's a big part. Um, as we found, you know, back in the day, um, divided it into three things. And there, was, there, there were the poems on image, there was the poems on sound, and there were the poems on, on uh, intellectual poems, philosophical poems, the poems on meaning. Um, and, and I think that was a useful distinction. Um, I do th I, the hope is that they can all function in the same poem. Um, and, and maybe I'm not there yet. Um, uh, maybe uh, that's the ultimate goal. That's great. I have a related question. Sure. I'm curious, Keith, about the notion about sound in your own writing, uh, kind of perhaps the organic, you know, that which spills out. I know mm -hmm. sometimes when I write things, it's like, whoa, you know, isn't that interesting? I'm wondering where that came from versus the craft. Yeah. I'm curious, would you um, comment on that? You know, I mean, um, there's a couple things to say about that. I mean, first of all, there is just simply the dumb, the dumb luck of it. You keep doing it, and sooner or later, you know, those monkeys are going to type them. Um, or at least, at least get to, to me and not to me. Um, and and um, so, there, so there's that, that the, the dumb luck of it. But, but um, I, mean, I mean, I think all of us who've written anything, whether, you know, whatever we're writing, um, there have been times you come back and you look at it, whoa, I wrote that. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's kind of amazing. Um, so there is that. Um, of course, as any kind of luck, it happens when you put yourself in the place where luck can happen to you. <laughs> um, so if you go looking for luck, it's more likely to happen to you than it is. Uh, not always, there are no guarantees. You still may have a miserable life, but, but uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more like. But then there's also the fact that you work at it, okay? So, I mean, I've spent now 45 years thinking every day about poetry and reading poetry almost every day and writing it almost every day. 
Um, so I've learned some things. And some, and some of those things are not very articulate, as you already know. Uh, 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 but, but they're there, and, they're, and, and, and so I can play off those kinds of things. Um, sometimes that's a problem, because I will, I will write something, and then I'll, go, I'll immediately know what rhythm I am echoing that in some poem that was important to me 25 years ago. Um, but but um, I mean, there is that simply the fact of, of, of doing it. Um, there's actually a third element then too, which is which is one that it took me the, uh, the longest to convince myself. There is talent. There are people who are just better at it. Mm -hmm. people, uh, there, there are a lot of people who are better at it inherently than I am. I had a friend when I first came back from from France and to Michigan um, and, and came back to North America and I came to Michigan. There was a guy I knew. Uh, and, I mean, and I knew he wasn't working very hard. He was real smart. I knew he wasn't working very hard, and he was drinking way too much. Um, and uh, but then he would just like knock out these poems, which is incredible. And he'd not change them, and he'd send them off to like the Nation and Poetry Magazine, and he'd get them accepted. At 23, 24 years old, I wanted to shoot him. Um, you know, except yeah, he was a friend. But it was like uh, uh, that was the best man in his life. Uh, and, and it was just, and he clearly had an ability to to find these things. Now, nothing ever came from that particular person's ability. The body became much more important to him. Um, he's still alive, but he really hasn't done any work to speak of in 30 years. Um, so, so he, in, in some ways, he, he, he convinced himself that his talent, which was manifest to me, I, mean, I didn't want to believe in talent. It's all hard work, you know. I'm a far boy. You know, I there. And, and it was clear this guy was just had to be. So there's, you know, some of those things. This one's a little easier, I, I hope. Um, what was the first poem you ever wrote? Um, I first moved to the United States when I was in the sixth grade. I remember this. I, I, I even have a copy of the poem. Awesome. <laughs> um, and my, I came from rural Western Canada. My family was, uh, my father was a minister in a, in a small, uh, very conservative denomination. It was Ashu and Mennonites. Um, we came to Northern Indiana where there was another little part of our group. We lived in South Bend. So, and it was 1963. Uh, Okay. Um, I spoke funny. I was right on the, you know, looking, beginning to look into uh, to pubescence. Um, it was the beginning of the '60s. Um, I was I'd gone from rural Western Canada to what was already a dying industrial town. Studebaker had closed in South Bend. South Bend was very beat up. Um, there were all the things that were just about to happen in the United States. Um, I was very, I was I was shy because I didn't know how to deal with these Americans. Um, the first day of school, I got kicked out of school because we had to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. So, uh, I must have stood up, but I didn't know the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and part of my little adolescent brain was going, "I'm not going to Pledge of Allegiance to that because I'm a Canadian." <laughs> um, uh, but they kicked me out of school, and, and and they would say, "Why aren't you saying the Pledge?" And I just stood there, you know, being like a little boy with my lip quivering. I'm not going to cry in front of these authority figures. Um, and so you got to know the principal. So I go to the principal, why didn't you say the Pledge of Allegiance? And I just stand there with my little lip quivering. And they kicked me out of school. First day of school in the United States. And so um, it, 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 was, it, it set the pattern for my public school education. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, so I didn't really fit in. And my English teachers didn't, would, would always like, they would, I, I wrote one thing, I remember I wrote this little thing about, because I was, it came from the mountains, and I was nostalgic for the mountains. I hadn't yet learned to love the Midwest. Um, and I wrote this little thing about mountain goats talking to each other. And my English teacher didn't believe I wrote it. <laughs> I believe I copied it out of, out of some book for children, uh, which means I did, you know, just got pissed off at him. Um, and then, of course, they'd always fail me because I would spell color with a U and favor with a U, center R-E and painter R-E. Um, and this was, you know, this was the, the continuation of 1950s education. Somewhere in there, I wrote the first winter, sitting, looking in my window in my backyard, this very blue collar neighborhood of South Bend, Indiana. Um, I watched the snowstorm, and I wrote it down. And I didn't write it in lines or anything else. I, you know, I knew about poetry because I came from our, our, our culture. We, we couldn't watch television, we didn't go to movies, um, you know, and we, and we worshipped the book. 
and we memorized the book um, in the King James translation, which, by the way, is beautiful language. Um, so when you got a bunch of that in your head as a ten-year-old, you know, you've got kind of a sense of uh, beautiful language in your head. Um, so, but I wrote these words down, and I took them, and one of the few guys I talked to, um, who later went to jail for dealing drugs, um, but but um, he said, you know, in, in our sixth grade desk, he said, no, oh, you just make that a poem. And I said, well, how do you make it a poem? And he said, well, you just scramble all the lines and make it look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and uh, I called it the passion of winter. And I scrambled all the lines. And my English teacher, who I'd, I'd, I'd had those problems with, Mr. Rensberger, just went nuts for it. And was like, I'm a poet. You know? And then, of course, at that point, right at the same time, I became genuinely bitten by books. My rural upbringing, you could always go out and do things outside. We were always outside. Now I was living in a, a Midwestern American city, um, not feeling very comfortable. And, and I used to get beat up a lot, too. Um, so it was like, well, um, so I, I, I you know, became bitten by books. And, and so all of those things happened about in the same two or three year period. And it was very formative to me. Um, and, and, and at some point, then I, I clearly, the 60s happened. I was in high school in the late 60s. Um, I was separating from my religious upbringing. Um, and, and it became for me books, books and, and a certain kind of high culture. Basically, it's not a bad guy because I was not you know, very well formally educated. So I basically, I mean, I ran away from home a couple times when I was still a kid. And then when I was 19, I, I, I got enough money for a one way ticket to Europe. I went to France and stayed in France for the next three or four years. Um, and, uh, and I was desperately poor and learned French and was in love for the first time. Jamie's not all like those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was kind of a wonderful moment. And things got set in my head. Is that a little bit Great. This is a good um, transition into the next question, which is about translation. Mm -hmm. um, if you could just talk about, about that, your experience with translation. Sure. Um, okay, so I come from a country that is officially bilingual, although I come from the most um, Franco-phobe province in that country, um, but French was always around us, um, although if anybody in the 50s and the 60s in Alberta was learning French, they were announced it in public. Um, and then there was that whole sense of the Bible. So there was, and, and my father was a minister, but my father's actual undergraduate degree, my father became sort of the president of our tiny little Bible college, and 35 students in Alberta, because he had an official degree from a liberal arts college in the States, of course. And his degree was in classical Greek. So, and he learned Greek so he could read the Bible, of the New Testament. And um, so Greek was around our house uh, all my life. Uh, the only class I went to in high school was Latin. I, re I read a poem last night, which is a new poem. I'm still not sure whether it's very good, but this, this, um, which came when I started looking at languages early on. Um, it was like, and I was for, I mean, an image again in of what was going on in my head. It was like I went to a part of my brain I never or barely been to before, and it was hard to open the door into that part of my brain. I had to, you know, I crank it open and oil the hinges, and it still kind of squeaked like an old movie. And once I looked in there, it was all clean, uncluttered, with all this space that could be explored, and it smelled good. Um, and I still feel that when I when I study languages. I mean, it's amazing. And when I go back, I mean, you know, because I don't. When I go back, even the only language that I mean, I worked with probably ten languages, but probably the only one that was ever really good was French. Um, and, and I don't use it enough now, so I have to go back. And I still have that feeling. It's like, whoa, there's this part of the brain that I don't use in any other situation. Um, and then, of course, if you are if you are passionate about books and passionate about writing, passionate about the sounds of language, all kinds of languages, um, then you have this a, a literary tradition that opens up for you. And you have all these other things to read, um, which is so cool, you know? Um, and some of those things moved me enormously. <coughs> when, and, and, and sometimes I think I could translate that experience into English. Um, and it would be good for me to try it, it would be a good exercise for me to try it, but I can also sort of 
let other people in on it um, who are not going to, you know, for whatever reason, have the time to, to fiddle with that particular language. Um, and that's, you know, there's something kind of, kind of beautiful and wonderful in that. Also, when, as a writer, you're looking for other kinds of influences. Um, there are certain things that shape us as writers, but they're always, you know, we're always, we're always running up against the confines of our language. You know, I'm always up running, you probably are too, running up against pronouns in English. How the hell do we get that pronoun to refer to what we want it to refer to? It's why, it's why, it's, it's the hardest thing in our language for, for, for foreign speakers to master those pronouns. Um, and, and it's, well, how do you do it? Okay, well, then we can look and see how somebody else did, which is kind of finding another language in another situation where pronouns are more complex or less complex, maybe where they don't even exist. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a lot of fun and, and instructive for how we learn our own language. I'm also intrigued as a poet. Um, there's you know, the sort of standard thing, the Robert Frost thing, that you know, poetry is what is lost in translation. I think, I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I, I worked a lot with Greek poets, uh, and the best known Greek poet is, is Kavathi. Um, and there's W.H. Ogden wrote an introduction to a Kalapi translation in the late 50s, uh, which has become a rather famous essay for those who do modern Greek stuff in, in English, uh, in which he says, Ogden, who was a very formal poet, who was very much in that Robert Frost vein, poetry was lost in translation, in which he says in this introduction, um, I would recognize a poem by Kalapi, uh, no matter who translated it, no matter where I saw it, and no matter which language that I can read, that I can read it, you couldn't read Greek. He said, I don't know why, he said, that puzzles me. I don't know what it is, um, and, and I, mean, well, I can guess what it is because there's some pretty unique things about Kalapi. But but it's almost as if I almost reluctantly is saying that no, poetry is what survives the translation. <laughs> um, all the other things might get lost, but but the poetry is what survives the translation, um, and that's kind of cool. Um, and and I have had that feeling. Uh, the the I've, I've translated. Uh, from uh, a little bit from French, less from Spanish, and, and quite a bit from modern Greek. Um, even though my modern Greek, even when it was good, it was not great. I had a co-translator whose Greek was uh, significantly better than mine. Um, but I, I was dealing with a very troubled poet who had no reputation in English. Um, he's not always very well known in Greek. He's a, he's a depressive, gloomy poet. No, he's, he's the Greek sylviopath, except there's a lot of gloomier than sylviopath. And also it was a suicide. And, and so I, sp I spent 10 years, and I'm a pretty, you know, jovial kind of superficial guy. Uh, and and uh, so I spent 10 years with this, with this gloomy Greek. Uh, and I really got a, a, a sense, and he died at 32, so, I mean, he wrote some great poems, but, but you know, his great poems were probably still to be written. Um, I mean, that, that's, that seems to be pretty young to, to and we translated, we, we translated, we set up, part of my, my co-translator, Wanda, who's a real, much more of an academic than I am, he wanted to translate everything this guy had published in his lifetime. So, which means we translated and spent a lot of time on some really bad poems. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, some great ones in there. But it was a wonderful sort of feeling, by the act of translation, to move into, to, to, to cross over into this other life. Um, which is what we do when we read anyway. I mean, that's what reading Aesthetic readers, we, we, we come out of ourselves at least a little bit into another way. And, and to do it in the act of translation is, is, is a lot more important. And you know, when you do a book of translations, you know, your name ends up kind of small. Right? Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a, it, it, maybe, maybe translation is more of a spiritual exercise than actually writing is, or, or artistic uh, exercise. You know, translation is just like you got to get over that ego a little bit. Plus, it's just, you know, it's a lot of fun. Plus, you get grants for translation. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had this great fellowship for two months where we sat in, on, on the roads in this 19th century Turkish manner. Uh, with, you know, with the Aegean breaking below us, and the Beltemi blowing around us, and we sat there working these translations. It was great. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about frustration. You talked about it a little bit already, but. Um, but, you know, have you ever experienced failure of language, you know, what, just a moment of frustration? 
you know, ab ab absolutely. I mean, it's I mean, what are the you had you had Clayton Esselman out here, and I think Clayton Esselman one time somewhere said that uh, he publishes about a tenth of what he writes, and and I mean that seems to be a that seems I mean I think his his percentages are probably right. Um, and that seems to reflect my experience of it too, which means ninety percent of it. Uh, doesn't come up to snuff, or is fodder for the 10% that might go out there in the world. And then, of course, you know that the 10% that does get published, probably only about 10% of that deserves to be published. Um, so, um, so there's, there's just the frustration of the process. Um, it takes a long I mean, again, there are people who you know, write quickly and write well and brilliantly, um, or, or at least at some point in their life write brilliantly, quickly. Um, but I think most of us were just, it's a constant battle. I mean, it's a, whatever standard we set ourselves, and of course the standard that's out there in the world, which changes constantly, you know, the poems that were being published in 1979, even the poems that we would recognize as great poems probably could not get published now. Um, and the poems that are getting published now, getting all the attention now, 40 years from now, and you know, they're going to go, who's that? What do he do? So I mean, those frustrations are built into the process of, of, of making art in general. Um, it never became for me, never, I've never felt myself embittered by it, which other people have. Um, either because of recognition in the world, you know, you know, why is that SOB getting all this attention and nobody's reading me? Um, uh, why are they making so much money and I'm still you know, working in the bookstore? Um, I never felt that. Maybe because just it might be the rural thing. Again, I mean, I never expected anybody to pay attention. Um, so, you know, when I got to be 50 and people started paying attention, it was like, whoa, why'd that happen? It's so cool. And, I mean, I go around and I do a lot of these things, particularly around the state, but around the Midwest, and occasionally outside the Midwest. And you don't make a lot of money doing these. And, and you know, our house is paid for, we're doing, we're kind of comfortable. And, and my wife's busy and I'm busy. And, you know, she, she says, you don't have to go do this. We don't need the money. You know, we don't need that 200 bucks. That's my I said, man, but nobody paid attention until I was 50, and now they want me to go. It's like, how could I say no? Uh, so, uh, but so, but in the process, I never got, I never got frustrated or embittered. But lots of people did. I mean, the guy, my example, the guy with talent, he clearly got embittered because he thought the world should sit back and pay attention to his talent. Um, and, and when they didn't, he just got drunk. Um, and and you know, I mean, I, maybe that's constitutional. Yeah. So there's that aspect of it. The frustrations of the work. I mean, I have things I want to write that I'm not going to be able to write. You know? um, some people know this. I, mean, I really had a wonderful, several people I think here know this, the story of my, what I discovered. Um, my Irish immigrant great grandmother's suicide, which happened in Western Canada, and I discovered it at State Street in Harbor in a book that was about to be sold for $3. Uh, and I've written about that and uh, Tom Fricky and I did a, did a conference that, that was sort of built, that was, that was part of the conference, um, of the documentary imagination. Um, I wrote one good essay, which I think is probably the best essay I've ever written. And I've written about uh, I've written three other little essays around that. Um, I wanted to write a whole book about her. I did a lot of research. I even got a grant from a now defunct part of the University of Michigan. Uh, <laughs> Maybe because they gave me a grant is why they didn't The And I did, I went out to Alberta and I, I amassed a bunch of material, maybe too much material. Um, and thinking this was going to be a book. At the time I had an agent, he knew the story, and he said, Oh, Keith, this is your million dollar book. And you know, it didn't happen. I didn't write that. I wrote one good essay and three sort of tangential essays and a few poems around about all of that information. Um, so that's frustrating. I would have liked to have written that book. I think it could have been an important book. Um, it was a it was a window. You know, we all know that the history of women is the history that's been overlooked, particularly the history of poor women. And this discovery I had about my own family gave me a little window into that. You know. So it seemed like a book that needed to be written, but it's not. I've not yet been able to write it. So I was actually working on polishing one of the essays just this morning. Correct. So that's that, that's been a frustration. Can you talk more about your writing? Or you don't want to? 
Sure. No, no, I'm happy to. I'm I, happy I'm to. Um, you didn't know about her? No, nobody did. I, I found a book. So I was working at Jim Graham Bookshop, and, and, and the owner of that bookshop used to go around to, uh, there's all these little academic journals that are in basements around the university, and they have readerships of five people scattered <laughs> around the world. Now, really arcane stuff. And they get, they get uh, review copies sent to them. Um, and, and, and like of arcane material. This is the only hope these poor authors have of a review. Um, and of course, most of those books aren't reviewed. So, so the guy who wrote Jim Drum was always trying to figure out a way to keep the bookstore going, fail finally. But he would go around and he would give these people, like, you know, he'd get 100 books for 10 bucks. And then he'd go and he'd put them on his sale tables outside. Most of, and of course, the books would be destroyed in the snow, and street people would take them, and college students would take them to try to resell them. Um, so you, you didn't do it to make money, you did it to draw people in. And these were arcane books. I mean, I used to, when I used to price these books, I put them out there. Was like, I remember one, he had two copies, this gigantic book, which had all the Latin names to all the insects in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's going to be a few people interested in that in Missouri, maybe three in Missouri. Um, but he had them, and you know, he had them for three bucks. Um, one of the ones I remember was his farming practices in 12th century Syria. I was thinking, boy, you, I mean, you know, I can imagine being interested in that, but you really, that's a specific. So we, we pulled out this one, it was before Art Fair. We'd always put this crap out for Art Fair, because, you know, we'd always go to Art Fair. And you sell anything at Art Fair. So uh, he pulled out this book, and he, he looked at the title and he laughed. And he sort of threw it at me. He said, Keith, nobody in three states would read this except you. And the title of the, of the book was Pioneer Policing in Southern Alberta, Dean of the Mounties, 1880 to 1914. And I looked at that and I said, no, Carl, even I'm not going to read that. You know, right? But So I took it upstairs. I was going to put it up in the street for our fair. And I decided I had to look up my hometown. When I went to it, there was one reference to my hometown. And, and when I read one, then I realized what this is, was, were police reports from the mountains. The, in, in that time when Alberta and Saskatchewan became provinces, Alberta became a province in 1904, which is when my Irish immigrant relatives arrived. Um, and so there's this one story, it's called True Faithful Life. And there were a couple things that threw me off at first. My, my family's name was Finley, F-I-N-L-A-Y, and the mountain had written Finsley, F-I-N-D-L-A-Y. Um, so the back threw me off. Plus, that little, where they were, 50 miles outside my hometown, had a regional name called Kansas. Later on, I found out that they changed it in 1909 because they got away from the problem with the state. Um, but it, what I always knew was Westcott. So it was like, well, I don't know where that is, close to where I grew up. And, you know, it's this weird, weird coincidence with my. But as I read it, all the other names were the same. All the other stories were counted to the Mountie about why this woman might have gone out. Kill herself, um, we're the same. And, and um, I realized as I was reading it that I was reading the story of, of my great grandmother's suicide, and nobody alive knew that she did it. They had hidden it in my grandparents' generation, successfully in my grandparents' generation. She, uh, she'd had 11 children, nine of, of them had survived. They'd been desperately poor in the North of Ireland, and they'd come over, and they were desperately poor in Alberta. Their house burned down, their first crops were destroyed by, by uh, hail. Uh, they had no money, and, and she, it clearly great grandpa was, was a little bit of a son of a bitch. Um, and and uh, the, uh, the, the, when I got to the end of the police report, I'm ruining my narrative over here. My essay tells it better. Um, when I got to the end of the police report, the Mountie had transcribed her suicide. So in July of 1996, I was on State Street in Ann Arbor, Michigan reading the suicide note my great-grandmother had written in 1907 in Alberta. I almost fainted. I'm pretty good if, you know, if somebody keeled over right now, or if, you know, Aubrey's wound on her leg started bleeding, I would, I would do things, you know, I'm pretty good in those situations, but I almost fainted. It was like, whoa! So, and it, it, started, it was addressed to her older children, one of whom was my grandfather, and it starts out, your father told me to leave the place this morning if I would not sleep with him. I love my children. God knows I love my children. I don't want any more children. So she went out to the outhouse and drank a jar of acid. So, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, there's lots of, lots of very obvious and important ramifications of that that we need to, that, that we keep, that we need to keep telling ourselves. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, I wrote a story about finding it, an essay about finding that, which couples with the, the stuff I could find from the family. 
So it was, you know, it was, it was, I, mean, I think I did okay by the story. Also, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't get really weird about things, but the fact that that story came to me 90 years later, the one of her descendants who has thought about stories, because I'd written some poems when I came back from Europe, um, I'd written a bunch of poems about them. I knew the names, and I knew the stories, and I collected some of those. I was probably the only one of her descendants who would who would recognize it because of those things. Um, and it felt a little as if this story had a life of its own, and that I had a certain responsibility to it since it found its way to me. Where can we read it? Um, the essay is, uh, uh, you can get to it on my website, which is www.keithtaylorannarbor.com. There are a lot of Keith Taylors in the world. Um, and, and there's a section in there um, on uh, online stuff. And I published it in Michigan Court of Review mm -hmm. um, in a, a couple of issues at the time, and I go ahead and do that. And uh, um, so it's there. It's also going to be the first essay in the book of essays I'm doing right now called Attempted History. So I was going to ask if you were going to read that. Yeah. That's, uh, you can also happen? get it to the Michigan Court of Review website. Yeah, Michigan Court of Review website. That's okay. What do you have to the book? The book, uh, it's right now, Wayne State University has asked to see it. Uh, hopefully I'll have the manuscript to them tomorrow. Um, and then, but then the process will take a long time. Um, and the book won't be out before 2013, maybe 2014. So. Uh, but you can get it, plus there's pictures of the family and on the website. Yeah, but and again, again, you know, it's a story that deserves writing. But maybe my daughter will. Write it. She can use the material. Like. But, but you did a, you know, you did a series of the fact that this book is not fiction. So I was just telling my wife about that book on the drive home last night, and then I looked for your copy. Of the book. We don't have it around anymore. It must have loaded to some damn yeah. graduate student who never even bought it. Yeah. Uh, What's going on? Oh yeah. 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 Um, I talked about that later. Okay. Sure. Um, so, what advice would you give to high school students? Um, well, you have to I have. When I go to high school. I, I go to high yeah. schools a lot. Um, I, I usually go to like, when, I, when I, I go to some private high schools that pay a lot of money. I usually then I always try to make sure that I go to some rural, usually West Michigan or Northern Michigan high schools that don't have any money. Um, and it often feels like the most useful thing I do to go to some of those schools. Um, I, you know, I mean, my, I mean, again, it's, it's my advice to high school students, and I give it freely, and I give it all the time. But, you know, around all you guys, it sounds so fatuous. But it's, it's, it's like, you know, yes, you can do it. <laughs> um, don't let your economic condition, don't let the reputation of your high school, uh, don't let, you know, the fact that you screwed up in, in a high school education, um, don't let any of that stop you. Um, that that uh, the Republic of Letters is indeed a republic. Um, and and um, it's, it, it's open to people who have persistence and who have ability. Um, well, and maybe you're going to be 50 years old before much of anybody gives you any strokes for that. But but um, but along the way, you can have a pretty good time. You get to know lots of cool people, and uh, you get to go to cool places. You never have a lot of money, but that's okay. Um, and uh, um, so just just keep doing it. Just keep trying to look at the world fresh. Keep trying to you know keep trying to whatever skills you have, keep working at it. Keep Keep your passion, but, but again, it sounds so fatuous. Um, but I'm just—I mean, I, I am a living example of, of why, how a certain kind of uh, persistence can, can overcome cultural disadvantages, um, can overcome certain historical disadvantages, um, can overcome, you know, even personal, you know, a decade of living on the road and smoking too much marijuana. Um, you know, they can, you can overcome all those things. Um, and, and still keep doing things.